Thank you, Megan. Once again, good morning. Welcome to Community Christian Church. So good to have you with us here in this building and wherever you might be. As you just heard, we're right in the middle of a series we've entitled Mark, or the Gospel According to Mark, and our plan is to stay right here in this Gospel for the next couple of months and to take this series all the way to the end of April, which includes the Easter season, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And so we're really looking forward to that. The reason we chose Mark is because it fits perfectly with our New Year emphasis, which is to fix and focus our attention on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. And we didn't come up with that brilliant sermon theme all by ourselves. As you well know, we got a little help. It's in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 2, and it, it gives us that instructions. And so uh, this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be going after um, fixing and focusing and shifting our attention on Jesus. What we need today more than anything else is a fresh view of Jesus, his teachings, his words, his ministry, his love, his compassion. Uh, it's something that I think that we need to make a purposeful effort on doing. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to do it for the next several weeks. And we're going to start, uh, or we're going to continue today in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 6, beginning with verse 30. You can turn in your Bible, mobile device, or you can follow along with us on the screen. Mark chapter 6 beginning with verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. And then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat. In what? All right, just checking. They went by boat to a solitary place, but many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed, or when the boat came to shore, and he saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. It's already very late. Send the people away so that they may go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he, Jesus, answered and said, you give them something to eat. Who? You. You give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we going to spend that much money on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. Then Jesus told them to make all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, Jesus gave thanks and he broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. And the number of men who had eaten was 5,000. All right, an incredible miracle. Uh, every miracle that Jesus performed was incredible. But this was an outstanding one. And this is also a very familiar story, often referred to as the feeding of the 5,000. But when you read this same companion account in Matthew's gospel, you find out more specifically that Matthew tells us there were 5,000 men besides women and children. So in all actuality, the number could have been well beyond the 5,000. It could have been 10,000 or 12,000 or maybe even more. And again, this is a story that we all know very well. We heard it in Sunday school. We've read it countless times. It's been preached over and over again. And because we know this story so well, oftentimes we just read right over the top of it 
And we lose sight of the important lessons, the practical and spiritual lessons that are contained here. I mean, there is so much more to this story than simply a demonstration of Jesus' power and authority. And how, much, how many of you know it took a lot of power to do what he did here? But there's more to it than just that. There's power, but there's a whole lot more. The fact is, something about this one miracle caused the Holy Spirit to prompt all four gospel writers to include it in their stories. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all write about it. And check this out. With the exception of the resurrection miracle, Jesus being raised from the dead on Easter morning, this is the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels. Jesus performed some 30 outstanding miracles. And this is the only one, the one we just read, that makes it into the four Gospel Hall of Fame. And when I hear something like that, when I learn that kind of statistic, it means something to me. It's significant, and it warrants a close and careful look at what happened here, more so than just understanding there was a time when Jesus fed a multitude of people with a small amount of food. So let's take a look at this story. Here in the opening verses, we learn that Jesus and his disciples are tired. In fact, they're exhausted. And not only are they extremely tired, they're hungry. Not a good combination for men being tired and hungry at the same time. In fact, probably not a good combination for anyone. And there were so many people coming and going, the scripture says. So many needs to be taken care of. So much work to be accomplished that disciples didn't even have a chance to eat and they had worked well into the afternoon. So no breakfast. It said they hadn't eaten all day. No breakfast, no lunch. None of these guys thought to bring snacks and they were hungry. So at some point, Jesus says, hey, guys, I know this little diner across the other side of the lake. They got some really good burgers there. Let's go check out that place, and let's get a late lunch. And so they all piled into the boat. Remember, we said they were in a boat. And they went across, made their way to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But by the time they docked the boat, the people that had saw, that seen them get into the boat, they started following him, and they came out of the woodwork, the scripture says. I mean, from every town and every village and every city, the surrounding areas, they came and they formed this huge multitude of people, just a, a sea of people as far as the eye could see. And Jesus, as soon as he stepped foot off the boat, what does he do? He's moved with compassion because he immediately identifies the needs in the group and he begins to minister. He begins to do the things that only Jesus can do. And he speaks life into the crowd and he teaches them many things and possibly he restores some of their, them physically and emotionally and spiritually. And there's such a powerful anointing on him that afternoon that he loses track of the time and it got late. And the disciples, you know, standing around as the service is going on and on and on, says, Jesus, we need to close this thing out. Get a song together. Let's close it in prayer. Let's do something. Let's send these people home. They've got to get something to eat. Remember what Jesus said to them? You feed them. You provide for them. I want you to take care of this need. And the disciples said, are you kidding us? How are we going to do this? How in the world are we going to feed this many people? We don't have the money to pay for everybody's dinner. And who are we going to get at this hour right now to cater to everyone? And so they're having this little exchange, verbal exchange with Jesus, when all of a sudden, Andrew, one of the disciples, he holds up a sack lunch. It's some kid's leftover fish and chips, maybe from that same diner that Jesus was talking to his disciples about. Jesus takes that little sack lunch, just a couple of loaves, of bread, a couple of slices of bread, you know, some flat bread, and a few fish, two fish, and he prays over it. He looks to heaven and he prays over his meal. I sure hope we're still doing that, friends. Amen. 
I, I hope we're taking the time just to thank God for his provision because he blesses us in so many different ways. It takes just a couple of seconds to stop and bow your head and say, thank you, Lord, for this food. He takes that meager amount of food and he passes it to his disciples. And the scripture is clear to tell us that he broke it up so that each one of those 12 disciples had a piece of bread in their hands. And I don't know how in the world he did, but he broke those two fish into 12 pieces, maybe an inch or two of fish each. And when they had bread and fish in their hands, and they're thinking, man, I finally get something to eat here, Jesus said, now you feed the multitudes. Are you getting the picture? Can you imagine what must have been going through their minds and how they looked at Jesus when he asked them to take a little tiny morsel of food, a little bit of bread and fish, and to feed the crowd? But being around Jesus in the past and seeing what he had done, being there with him in Cain of Galilee when he turned water into wine, they just did what they were told. And they began to pass out the bread and the fish that had been prayed over. And to their total amazement, everybody ate. The thousands of people were fed. And this wasn't just a little two-piece fish snack here. This was more like an all-you-can-eat buffet because the scripture tells us they all ate and what? Were satisfied. And which means a couple of those bigger fellas, they probably pigged out on some fish. But they all ate. All of them. Everyone in the whole crowd. They were set. Every need was met. And after it was all said and done, after everybody was full and Jesus dispersed the crowd, he dismissed them to go home, the scripture tells us that the disciples, not wanting to waste anything, they gathered together the leftover fragments and there were what? Twelve baskets full of fish and bread. Not just a little bit, all the way to the top. Twelve different baskets. Started with a, a little sack lunch, ended up with twelve baskets of fish and bread. Amazing. What a miracle. A lot here that we could talk about. However, for the purpose of this message this morning, I want to just pass along two lessons. That's it. Just two quick little lessons. And if you haven't already embraced these lessons that I'm going to be talking about, if you could, if you could allow these simple words to get deep down in your heart, these are life-changing lessons. These will change the way you live. They will change the way you think. Let's take a look at them one at a time. Lesson number one. According to this story that we just read and the interpretation that I just gave to you, the resources that God gives to us are to be shared with others. I'm going to say that again. The blessing, the supply, the finance, the resources that God blesses us with, it's not just for us. One of the main reasons that God passes the blessing along to us is so that we can share it with others. And yes, God does want to bless us. God wants to promote you. God wants to give you all your needs. Just like Phil was talking about, he supplies all of our needs. But it's not just for us. The blessings of God are to be shared with the people around us. Now, do you have any idea how hungry Simon Peter was on this occasion when he saw his brother Andrew show up with that little sack lunch? I mean, his mouth started watering because he was hungry. I mean, he was starving. And Simon Peter's blood sugar had dropped to a dangerously low level. And when that happens, when your blood sugar plummets, what happens is the pancreas stops producing insulin. And alpha cells in the pancreas, this is true, you can check it out, it sends a nasty little hormone to the brain. 
And most people, when that happens, get hangry. That's right, some worse than others. Peter had it really bad. He was about ready to take Andrew's head off. And he said, don't you dare give that little lunch to anyone else. Don't you bring it to Jesus. You give it to me. I need that fish sandwich more than anybody else in this place. Because if I don't get something to eat and get it to eat fast, it's not going to be a pretty sight around here. So Peter took Andrew aside and said, at the very least, let's share it. You and me, just the two of us. Don't, don't, don't bring it to Jesus. But somehow, they overcame their selfish impulses and they brought what little they had to the Lord. And that's a statement that I tell you from time to time contains a lot of power. Somehow they were able to overcome their selfish impulses and they brought what little they had to the Lord. Listen, there's a totally different outlook to this story if Andrew was not willing to bring to Jesus and share what he had found. Did you hear me? This story ends totally different if Andrew wasn't willing to share what he had gotten his hands on. And keep in mind, the only reason he had something to give in the first place was because of someone else's generosity. That little boy, when he went through the crowd, one little boy had a few pieces of bread. That little boy was willing to give it to Andrew. And in that situation, who in their right mind, when you saw that many people and only this meager amount of food, who would have possibly thought that Jesus could do anything with that tiny little bit of provision. Mark 6.38 tells us, five loaves and two fish. That's it. It's all they had. Five slices of bread and two fish. Do you know it's easy to conclude or to think, what can I do? What I have is not going to make a difference. It's not going to be significant. The little bit that I have to give is not going to change anything. Why would I even get involved when there's a need? Because I don't have much to give. You see, nobody in this account, no one who contributed to the miracle had that mindset. Nobody thought that way. Everyone involved was willing to do their part and everyone was willing to share the little bit that they had. And Jesus took that little bit. He took just that tiny little bit of food. He blessed it and every single need, every pressing need in that multitude of people, among that group of people, all those needs were met. See, that's the power of sharing. It was a five-star miracle. Say that. It was a five-star miracle that started with five pieces of pita bread. It's a pretty good miracle. All right, that was lesson number one. The resources that God gives to us are meant to be shared with the people around us. Lesson number two. When you're willing to share a portion of your blessing, God will meet your, finance, your, your future needs. When you're willing to share the blessing that he's given to you, you can be confident that God is going to meet your future needs. Not just everyone else's needs. He's going to meet my need. God is going to know what I need. And when he sees the heart that I have, a heart like his, which is willing to give and willing to share, God will meet my need. Look at verse 43 one more time. Mark chapter 6 and verse 43. After everyone had eaten, the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken, fish, broken pieces of bread and fish. 12 basketfuls. Do you remember how many disciples there were? How many? Yeah, there were 12. Judas was still there. He hadn't checked out yet. 12 disciples. 12 men who were able to put aside their selfish inclinations, and even though they had 
worked all day, and even though they were tired, they were hungry, they were exhausted, they took the bread and the fish that Jesus put in their hands, and those 12 shared what Jesus gave to them with the entire multitude. Everyone in that crowd that day received something at the hands of one of those 12 disciples. 12 disciples, 12 baskets left over. You think that's a coincidence? I don't. Because what happens is the Spirit of God reveals to us that each one of those disciples were able to claim one of those baskets. You see, the scripture says in Luke 38, 37, 38, when you give, it shall be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And again, Philippians 4, 19, the very verse that, Paul, that uh, Phil shared earlier, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Friends, these are principles of sowing and reaping. They work. They're laws that God has written into humanity and into the world. Amen. When we're willing to share what God has given to us, we don't have to worry or be afraid of the future because he meets our future needs. You know, whenever I'm sowing slices of bread, whenever I'm casting out little breadcrumbs to the people around me, you know what I'm looking for? A basket. Because on the other side of every slice, you'll find a basket. Now, that's not the reason that you give. You don't give just because you think you're going to get something. The scripture says, give in obedience to God. You give because God wants you to share. You, you tithe because that's a, a, the way to honor God with your finances. But when you give, the Bible says, on the other side of your given, you, giving, you can expect something in return. And that's the principle that we learn here. Not only are we to share the blessing that God gives with us, the people around us, but when we do that, God will meet our future needs. And he's faithful to do that talk to anybody who's learned the principle of generosity and the principle of giving, and they will have that testimony. Now, in just a few moments, I want to share the 2020 financial report with you. Uh, this is something we do all the time. Uh, but, but just before we do that, let me, let me tell you one last story. A young couple just recently started attending Community Christian Church right around March of last year, so just before the coronavirus lockdown. They were here for a couple of weeks, and then we weren't able to meet together. They came back to the church in person right around the time that I announced the churchwide Give Back Sunday offering that we were going to be taking in November. And when I announced that, when I told everyone that we were going to be receiving the special offering in November, what I did is I, I said, I'm not going to give you a recommended or a suggested amount of money uh, to donate, but I'm going to ask you to pray about it. Spend a little time, seek the Lord, let him lead you, and, and if you can, be sacrificial. If God has blessed you and, if God is, uh, and you're in good shape financially, then ask God what you can give and do the best that you can. And so this couple, they decided to accept the challenge and they prayed about it, and the Lord dropped an amount of money in this gal's mind. Now, she was a little surprised when she heard the number in her heart because it was a big number. They're givers, they, they support the church financially, but this was more money, this is a bigger donation that they had ever given before. And so she was a little reluctant to share it with her husband. But a little bit later, after they compared notes, that's when she found out that the husband had received the exact same number from the Lord. The Lord gave him the exact same number that he had given to her. And even though it was a stretch for them, it was a huge amount of money, they talked about it, they prayed about it, they decided to give that amount of money to make that commitment. Well, two days later, that same week, not the week before, not the week after, that same week after they decided that they were going to give this amount of money, this gal was called into her boss's office, and the boss proceeded to tell her she was getting a year-end bonus. Now, this wasn't something that she got every year. 
She didn't get a year in bonus every year. She wasn't expecting it. She, she didn't know it was coming. It was a huge surprise to her that she was even going to get a little bit more money at the end of the year. Any idea how much that check was for? You would say exactly the amount, but it wasn't. It was twice the amount. Exactly twice the amount. So half for her, half for God. Now, you might hear that testimony, and you might say, you know, it was a coincidence. You know, that gal was going to get her check from the boss anyway. She was going to get that end-of-the-year bonus even if they didn't give any money to the church. And maybe you're right. Maybe it was a coincidence. But I wish you could have been there when this gal shared this testimony with me. I wish you could have heard the sound in her voice and so, seen the look on her, in her eye. Because there's no doubt in her mind or her husband's mind that this was God telling them how blessed and how proud he was of them and their willingness to take this financial step. See, it doesn't really matter what other people think or how they interpret the little events that happen to us. You know when God is speaking to your heart. You know when God is throwing something your way. And when these kinds of things happen, when you can put yourself in position to receive these little testimonies, they build faith. And they build trust in God. And you learn that you can't outgive God. There's no way. Because God will continue to meet future needs. He'll continue to show you just how happy he is, how pleased he is when we follow his promptings. And that's the key. It's just to be open and sensitive to the promptings of the Lord. Amen. And so this story here, the feeding of the 5,000, and incidentally it happens twice in the scripture. There was another time when Jesus fed 4,000. But it's so much more than just a story. So much more than just learning a little Sunday school lesson. It applies to our lives. And God is teaching us something and he's, he's reminding us how important it is to be willing to share. And so, Father, we just thank you for the truth that's found here in Mark chapter 6. We thank you, Lord, for the acknowledgement that this was one miracle that you laid upon all of the gospel writers' hearts so that we could read it four different times in the gospels. And, Lord, we want to take it to heart. We want to understand, maybe even in increasing ways, how important, how much value you place upon sacrificial giving and generosity and our willingness to not only believe that you will reward us and that you will bless us, but to have enough faith to say, Lord, okay, when you prompt me, I'm going to share the blessing with those around me. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for removing fear. Thank you for removing any anxiety or worry about how our needs are going to be met, but to trust in your word, to stand upon the promises of God that you are faithful to meet our needs. We just thank you, Lord God. We thank you for your word and the power that's in it. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.